Okay. Good evening, friends. I hope you are well. My name is Kim Hartman, and it is my honor to be here tonight to introduce the program, to welcome you all, and to serve as top fan of UJA's scholar and residence, Menachem Creditor. He's brought us Torah, music, and blessings every weekday morning. every weekday morning since March 18th, 2020. Today is Wednesday, November 17th, 2021. And this morning we celebrated 419 consecutive weekday mornings. So let's see who's here. We are blessed to have so many people in the room together tonight and over 300 kind souls on Zoom. Jewish week, Good evening, and thank you for helping to bring this conversation together. Penny, Mark, Eileen from Vegas, Eric, Deborah, Arlene, Valerie, I'm saying all the names that I hear every morning. <laughs> I'm not sure I know who, who you are, but you know, I'm just gonna say the names I hear every morning. Uh, we have Rabbi Deborah Joslo, welcome. Felice, Mark, Eric, Lisa, Cindy, Joey, so happy to see you. Rabbi Isaiah Rothstein, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Lori, it's good to see you and thank you for being such a good friend. Okay, so let's take a breath and start with some learning. Okay. Best laid plans. I thought we should sing. Ya da la la la. Ya da la la. Ya da la la la. La la la. You all sing in the morning. You admit it now. Ah, a ta da na. Thank you, everyone. A year of Torah is a celebration and a recognition of what we have all done together since March 2020. When I got ready tonight, I thought, what am I going to wear? I'm going to meet all these people I haven't seen. I don't know. And I decided to wear the white shirt because there were so many weeks when we were together that the days just blended. And I didn't know what day was, which day was it Monday? Was it Tuesday? But on Fridays, when I saw that white shirt, I thought, OK, we've made it. Another week's gone by, and we're still here. And I am so grateful to Rabbi Creditor and to all of you for being a community. I really, truly believe that what he has created is something special and a unique thing, a UJA pulpit. 
He not only shares the mission of UJA together with all of us each morning, but he embodies it so much by just being there, showing up. And that's what UJA does for the community here in New York. Whether people are feeling alone or hungry or suffering, UJA is here for them when they need them. Just like Rabbi Creditor is there for us every weekday morning when we need him. Now I would like to introduce our speakers. Rabbi Menachem Creditor is UJA's scholar in residence, and he is a frequent speaker around the US and Israel and was named Newsweek, was named by Newsweek as one of the most 50 influential rabbis in America. He is the author of 26 books and six albums of original music, including the global anthem, Olam Hesed Yabaneth. He has been involved in leadership of American Jewish World Service, APAC, the Rabbinical Assembly, and One America Movement. Rabbi Deborah Josloff is UJA's chief planning officer. She plays a critical role here at UJA to fulfill the organizational vision of caring for those in need and inspiring Jewish life and building communities of meaning and purpose in New York, in Israel, and around the world. She is, ordained, she is an ordained reformed rabbi with a master's degree in Jewish education. Rabbi Isaiah Rothstein is a rabbinic scholar and public affairs advisor for Jewish federations of North America. He leads JFNA's Jewish Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Division and Radical Justice Initiatives. He is also a member of the Schusterman Foundation's ROI Fellowship and was listed as Jewish Week's one of 36 under 36. In a moment, we will watch a quick video that emphasizes what it means to be a good neighbor in ways in which UJA shows up every day. And I would also like to share at the end of the program that Rabbi Creditor will be signing books personally. My mom is sick, so we're doing some construction in the house to enable the house to just be welcoming. I had a, a young girl who entered the elevator with me who's like, Danielle, right? And I was like, yeah, I grew up next door to you. And I just asked her a simple question, how's mom? I haven't seen mom in a while, how's your mom doing? And she said, my mom died in the pandemic. Throughout the pandemic, many people have retreated going into their homes, pulling back into their lives to keep themselves and their families safe. But it's very important that we do stay connected, ask those questions so we can help look out for each other through this time. I think that little communication, that, hey, how you doing, takes on a whole different meaning now. This is a moment for our community on so many fronts, and there's no vaccine for unemployment, for food insecurity, for mental health challenge, and we're seeing enormous growth in rising anti-Semitism in our own backyard. UJA Federation will continue to be at the forefront as we move forward, supporting our community in addressing the challenges ahead. Every time we got on a call and told somebody that we needed food, we were able to, within hours, have food at our pantry. We opened a second warehouse. We've expanded the number of digital pantries so more people can access our services online. Each of our clients is so unique. We are there to serve them and do so with dignity. I got my COVID vaccine because UJA was there. UJA has always had the privilege of serving Holocaust survivors and we're committed to ensuring that as many as possible have access to this vaccine. Sites in need from all over the world are coming to us with those supply lists and saying you have to help us. When we ask them, how are you and what do you need? We mean it because we're gonna show up. During the recent conflict, Literally every 15 minutes in Ashkelon, there was an alarm. Deliberate targeting of civilian homes uh, to cause terror is something that no country should have to live with, no people should have to live with. It is vitally important for Jews coming into Jewish institutions to feel secure. We also have to address the alarming rise in anti-Semitism. We have a community that supports us and who relies on us, and nothing is going to break that. We definitely saw an increase in mental health because people were isolated. We had a death in the family, then my dad got sick. To say that we rely on coming here is an understatement. 
I haven't seen my family the whole pandemic. Stephanie has been my lifeline and made sure that I knew I had someone I could call. We will continue to be there to have flourishing Jewish institutions, our JCCs, our synagogues, our day schools. We also know how important camp is to Jewish leadership, to creating Jewish engagement, and our investment in the Henry Kaufman campgrounds will pay dividends for our community literally for generations to come. Our support for the State of Israel is multifaceted. We are bringing together four preeminent schools, performing arts, television, theater, in the center of Jerusalem. Everybody was able to coordinate services and create seamless strategies in how we would help people, and we never had to say no. Only UJA has the capacity, the reach, the relationship, the expertise to handle all of these challenges at once. It's that elevator ride, it's that good morning, it's that how's things going, how's mom, even if the answers are hard to hear sometimes. It is our responsibility and privilege to care for our neighbors, to care for each other, and to really ask with intention, how are you doing? I know Kim had us do it once, but uh, if you'll humor me, I have been waiting a really, really long time to hear your voices, really a long time. I cannot tell you how touched I am to see all of you here, and I hope that you'll, you'll share that voice. It's one thing to imagine harmonies. It's quite another thing to see you here, and to everyone who's with us via Zoom, wherever you are, please let's sing. Let's just learn. Let's show up for each other. Okay. I don't know if I'll get through it, so I'll need you. every weekday morning of the last 419 consecutive mornings, even the ones I haven't loved. <laughs> and some of you will remember that there have been moments that I've shared of my own. I began this because my friend Mark, who's right in the back there, thought it would be a nice idea. <laughs> Mark Meaden of UJA, my friend, my teacher, suggested that maybe during the few weeks that life would be disrupted, a pick-me-up would be nice. <laughs> Little did he know that eventually all you would see on UJ's Facebook page would be this. <laughs> and 
And that's not a terrible thing either. To have shown up for each other is no small thing. I hope the content has been worthwhile, but that's not the point, really. It's an anchor for our lives. That's actually what Torah is meant to be. It's not an academic pursuit. It's meant to be our heart in the air, something that connects people to people. So now that we've said the bracha for learning, and Kim channeled me just right, greeting everybody by name. I was trying to figure out, can I see everyone's name tag, just to, to make sure, because I, mean, I know almost all of us. But Facebook only gives you so much. And I, I actually think, for all the, all the problematics of social media, look what a platform for Torah it granted us. The willingness of UJA to let us use that platform and the technology that was created by sacred people who did not know that coding was going to be a place of life. What an army of imaginative people it took to create this. So, hopefully you have in front of you some teaching. There are also some slides, so I'm going to go with slide one, whoever's handling things. And as they're put up and as I begin to teach, I want to make sure that I acknowledge someone who supported my work so beautifully, Hannah Barak, who's right over there. Thank you, thank you. And because this is really one of the few times I can say it with more than one of them on the screen at a time, I want to honor my children who are here. From the left side of my bedroom <laughs> to an actual sacred space in my home for Torah, my wife's idea was to have a sacred, sp sacred space for Torah. So Neshama is right over here, and I wanted to honor you. There are countless other people who helped make this happen, but I want to acknowledge three of the contributing authors who are here in the room, two rabbinical students, who each took a chunk of the Torah that we shared and brought their own hearts and voices to it. So Kyle Savage is right here. Rabbi Kyle Savage is here. Sarah, I saw you. Sarah Birnbaum is right over there. And Amanda Weiss is right here. They give me hope in the Jewish future, and I hope that they they have um, come through on these pages. It has been an incredibly humbling thing to see Torah back and forth in a conversation. None of us are going to get it just right. But if we share voices, maybe we'll get a little bit better. So here we go. Text one is straight from this. And I'm looking at all of you. We are all worthy of expanding in the world, of feeling life in the world, of the health more people deserve than have it, of the justice we as UJA, as a larger community, everyone everywhere, is, we are called to pursue it. It's not yet here, but we're not unworthy of it. And if you read this verse, this is Jacob on the other side of the river, afraid. Of course he's afraid. He's been through terrible things. I was self-conscious about choosing this text, both because we've been through very hard things. We've crossed a lot of rivers. And not all of us have been able to cross. And we should feel so aware, and I know we are, deeply grateful, and that gratitude should give us the strength to acknowledge it, to do some of the grieving that I don't know any of our programs will give us time to do. But as part of that healing, to know that we can come together with purpose, be sad and happy at the same time. I quoted a dear friend of mine, Perry, Zichronoli Vrachav, blessed memory, who, when I was doing his funeral, I shared something that he had taught me, which is that crying and laughing at the same time is a thing. He called it crafting. <laughs> Jacob is doing so many things. Maybe he was laughing too, but he certainly was crying. He was scared to see his brother. They hadn't connected in a long time. It doesn't have to be dysfunction that keeps us apart. It can be disease, actually. 
For some of us, this is our return to this holy space for the first time tonight. This is holy space, and it needs you here. We can't do this work if we do it with a sense of remove. So he says, too small am I for all the love and truth you've shown your servant. God, you've given me so much. Look at the second half of the verse. For with my staff I crossed the Jordan, and now I have become two camps. I crossed all by myself with my little walking stick. And look at me. And I'm saying this now. I was hoping to be able to with a full heart and look at you, I can. There are more of us here than have been in this space for a very long time. Not enough, but more than have been. Look at what we have. I'm not too small for this experience, but I'm humbled by it. I'm sure you are too. It takes a lot of courage right now to show up where other people are going to be. And what a blessing it is to feel presence. Look at where the Talmud goes. I don't usually go into Talmud in the mornings. I was taking advantage of the fact that I knew you'd have sheets. Can we go to the second slide? That would be awesome. This is straight from the Talmud, and I'll read it quickly enough so that we can get to our conversation. When are people vulnerable, says the Talmud, Masechet Shabbat. Reish Lakish said, when they're crossing a bridge, only when they're crossing a bridge and no other time, rather say anything like a bridge. And the whole entire world is like a very narrow bridge, isn't it? Rav Nachman taught us that. But here are three things that rabbis did in the ancient world with this suggestion, because they probably felt vulnerable too. And that should give us some comfort, right? Our ancient sages were uncomfortable sometimes and managed to make life happen. Rav wouldn't cross a river in a ferry in which an idol worshiper sat. Right? That, that's not such a nice thing to say. Okay, but still, he wouldn't. Why did he say, why wouldn't he? Because he said, because perhaps a judgment will be reckoned with them and I'll be implicated. I have to keep away from that person in order to be okay myself. That's certainly not the attitude we take as UJA. It's not the attitude I think Judaism calls us to take. We're not separate from our neighbors. We just witnessed how the notion that what happens to you won't happen to me is a complete fabrication. It's a myth. I understand wanting to be okay, but I can't be okay if you're not. The next one is so interesting then in that spirit. Shmuel would only cross a ferry. He would only cross a ferry in which there was an idol worshiper saying, Satan, we can deal with that another time, does not have dominion over two nations, which means I will fare better if I stick with you. How true that is. Look at the third thing. Rabbi Yan, I would examine the ferry and cross. This is what we call due diligence. As he taught elsewhere, a person should never stand in a place of danger saying that they will perform a miracle lest they do not perform a miracle for him. And if they do perform a miracle, they will deduct it from his merits. This is like the divine credit score. Right? Careful what you ask for because if you're blessed, you won't have more blessing later. That also doesn't ring true. But look at the proof text for it. Rabbi Hanin said, what verse teaches this? Minayin. When, when Jacob said, too small am I for all the love and trust you've shown your servant, fearing that by receiving a measure of God's kindness and truth, my merits have been diminished. So I just want to stand in conversation with the Talmud and with you, just as the Talmud stands in conversation with the Torah, in the same way that the Torah stands in conversation with reality. When does a person feel vulnerable? When doesn't a person feel vulnerable? The whole world at this moment is interconnected in ways no one would ask for. But can't that be an opportunity? I can't be okay if my neighbor's not, which means I have to know how my neighbor's doing, which means if I can't knock on their door, I'd better be on Facebook with them. I'd better call them, and as soon as it is safe, by which I have to do my due diligence and measure the ship, I have to trust the science and get vaccinated and encourage those who are doubtful to trust in the science because their lives matter. And I have to rage for justice even when I'm stuck at home because no one deserves to be alone or to be abandoned because everybody knows what it is to be vulnerable. We have to have learned that. Singing is sweet. Singing in the safety of our four cubits, wherever we find ourselves, that's sweet. And yes, it's brave. 
boy, has it been a miracle to see you there. We're going to keep on doing that, but we have to make sure that we do that in the public square too. We have to walk out into the world and say, who's vulnerable? How can I be present? What do you need? I just want to help. Jacob had a long way to go, and he ended up limping. So I said to someone earlier, I won't say who it was, tonight, and I've been so overwhelmed, I woke up crying this morning. It's in our eyes. You know that. What we've been through is in our eyes, and it'll always be there. But we showed up tonight, didn't we? We took everything we've built for 419 mornings. Oh my God. And we're here. And for me, that means so's God, which means so's everybody else. So let's just keep showing up in all the ways we can and in some of the ways we haven't been able yet. Let's show up in those ways too. It's one thing to help people find food in dignified ways. It's another thing to try to make sure they never get hungry in the first place. So let's work on the world. This book is a special thing, but it's really just a way of saying, hi, we have each other. We showed up. It's been a really hard year and a half. Let's get to work. So it's my delight to welcome my colleagues, my friends, Deborah and Isaiah, to join me. And let's have a conversation. Let's talk a little bit. Conversation. I wow. <laughs> it's time we invited each other to a conversation. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Um, wow, 420 days. That's a lot. Isaiah, there was a moment, we all had moments, right, that we thought, this will be over soon. We're going to get through this. We even then talked about going back to, right, when we were going to return uh, to what was. Um, I think 420 days later, we're pretty clear we're not returning to something. Um, and we find ourselves in what I call a half-baked place, mm -hmm. right? We understand now we have to move forward. It's not a pandemic. It's what they call now an endemic. This is a part of our lives. But, um, and we have some tools to build it, but of course, not all of the tools. So Isaiah, at this moment, why is this book significant for us? What role does it play for us in, in figuring this out? Mm, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. And just to, <laughs> really to be together in person is such a gift. It's, as you said, a shakhi on the moment. Part of me feels like we should like be putting you on a chair and doing like, <laughs> a, 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 a That'd be fun. Maybe we could get to that. Yeah. No, thanks. Just, just, the, just the bracha I want to offer you, though, Rabbi Menachem, just before I share on, on this comment, is um, you know, they say the word bracha also has the same root word as the word brecha, which means a funnel or to consolidate. So, so two brachas. One is the brecha piece, that to think about this book and the consolidation, not just of, of your energy, your spirit, your light, but really as Kim, as you mentioned about each of us and how this has served as an anchor, it should be a brecha that, that each of us should see ourselves as that blessing. Um, and then second to that, the second blessing I want to offer you is your name is Menachem Yosef. <laughs> and as a Menachem Yosef, to hear you even share Torah just now and the comfort that you've offered me personally, and I know that Menachem meaning comfort that you've offered so many others, and then the Yosef, as a code switcher, as someone who could speak many different languages, to speak to many different kinds of people, you should be blessed to just be Menachem Yosef every day of your life the way you've already been for all of us um, in such a profound way. So really. And then on the note of like, like Rabbi Deborah, on the note of like being, uh, living in this uh, liminal space, half-baked, the in-between, um, you know, I think the Jewish people, we've had this tendency for maybe always to live in the in-between, to live in kind of multiple truths, multiple realities. You know, there's the Jewish nostalgia of our past. There's the concerns and the, the neuroses maybe sometimes of what's coming in the future. The Lador Lador, we're, we are the in-between, you know. 
Some even view Jewish exile as the in-between for the second temple of Jerusalem to the third temple in Jerusalem in the Messianic age. Um, and I think thinking about this book and what the role of this book, Rabbi, as you shared about living in this in-between of COVID-19 and or COVID-20 and this pandemic, um, please God, it should, it should not exist in 2022 and um, we should be blessed in that way. But one thing that I think is, is, um, is a reality and a truth is that the pandemic rocked humanity um, and each of us in different ways. And so when to wake up in the morning and to see the news cycle ever changing, hard to even keep up. But there was one thing that was consistent, that, that at 9 a.m., as you would say, sometimes at 9 a.m. or 9 p.m., sometimes in my home, some, but you would just hear, yeah, da, da, da. And it would, it would be something that would ground us. And I think this book, A Year of Torah, but frankly, the role of Torah throughout our, our history as we live in this in-between um, is to hopefully ground us, is to hopefully root us, um, and to teach us that, that even amidst storms of living in society, specifically today all the more so, um, to have something that could root us in the storm. So this idea of like, you know, on the, note, the theme of Hanukkah, like this idea of holding a candle amidst a storm, huh. and you did that, and not only that, other people, and I spoke to people tonight too, other people were like, you're helping me keep my candle burning. You're helping me light other people up too. And to do that for 419 consecutive weekdays is, is really a gift. Amazing. Our light and that we carry forward. So pillar of light. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so at the beginning you did it because you're like, okay, you know, my people are in a storm, they're in a desert. I, I, I'm, I'll step up. I'll be the Naksha and I'll, I'll be the first one into those choppy waters and lead. Now, after a while, it must have occurred to you that um, not only were there a lot of people behind you counting on you, but you probably didn't know where you were going either. So what, and it wasn't a moment, right? It was something longer. It was a journey. So what did, after a while, what did you think you were building? What did you think you were creating? I, I loved in the intro to the book when you talked about how people turn their screens into portals. And literally, you did transport us. But inside your head, what was going on? What were you thinking about? Um, I have found such um, strength where I needed it. I don't know that I was consciously building something. I think I was, I'm not saying this to, to gain anyone's approval. I was coming for you. I need you. And Torah is how I meet people. Torah is the language that my heart speaks. Will Daraf was here, was my last hug before this all began. And he showed up. He's been showing up in the mornings. And we hugged again. And I feel better. I, and, and I don't think I feel good yet. You know, I think we have to be really, really tender and gentle with ourselves about this. I don't feel OK. And I haven't felt OK. But I felt better every time I turned it on. And when my Wi-Fi went down, God, I felt pain because I couldn't find you. So I would hook my phone up to where the computer was. So I mean, you know, my rabbi, you're asking the right question, but it's not a question that I, that I was thinking about. This book felt like the right way to mark time. And as I worked with the rabbinical students, that I was so blessed to be in relationship with, representing a, an almost, almost true diversity. We didn't have representatives from Yeshiva University, but every other rabbinical school in America was represented. To have new friends and to have meaning that we built together and poetry that was their words, somehow our hearts were connecting through it. I don't know that I was building anything intentionally. I was just showing up, hoping someone else would too. A lot of other someone else has showed up. But I was very struck by the fact, you know, there's a lot of conversation about um, our online communities, real communities. Mm -hmm. It's not that people don't show up, and we know that 
people can be positive influences and share the best of themselves and the worst of themselves in these kinds of platforms. And, um, but I, as I watch this thing flourish, whatever it was, or the party grow, <laughs> um, I, you know, I thought to myself, everybody wants to know, how did you do it? How did you make the virtual real? What was that special sauce that, right, because we're all living in these hybrid communities, and we all want to know how, could, how to make it a real community. You made a real community. I, you look at the chat in the mornings, and people, um, how's your husband? How's the garden doing? Did you find your cat? And I thought, <laughs> wow, these hundreds of people who don't know each other, who know each other by name, but they know each other. So yeah. tell us, what is it? Well, let, let me try not to sound like an authority to the question the whole world is asking me, except to point to four people in the room who are my teachers on this. Four of our five children are here, and they have experienced school and friendships mm -hmm. and connectivity mm -hmm. in a way that they were literate and we were immigrants. And so how to make something real when it isn't what I'm used to is really the question, and how to feel the texture in a relationship that is so far, at least visibly, two-dimensional. I'll, I'll simply say that in a moment of deep distress that I had during the last two years, a dear friend of mine, back from my days in Berkeley, uh, her name is Karen Ehrlichman. She's a phenomenal wisdom teacher, social worker, therapist. She and I were part of a fellowship, and she saw that I was in need. So she's on one side of the screen, it's Zoom, and I'm on the other. She said, Menachem, reach out to me. I was like, what are you, like, I'm going to bang my hand into the, <laughs> she said, just reach out to me. Close your eyes and reach out to me. And just for a fraction of a second, she was touching me. It has to do with, uh, Neshama teaches this a lot, right? Being able to dream with your eyes closed, see something beyond what is immediately visible. That's how it is to live more fully, to feel the possibilities of the world. And I think the screens, I mean, we're here, right? And some of the things you've said to me are, they're just too much to let in right now. But I, I heard them. And I know that they're true for me when I speak to you. I, I don't know what we're going to do next. Hybrid is this cold shower. Because either it's the intimacy through translation, or it's like, let's sit next to each other and have really bad coffee at the office. But how to be present and present, that's a new thing. That's going to be the real question, because some of us have, um, have not yet begun to feel safe. For all the right reasons, emotional, we're carrying trauma, we're worried for our immunocompromised selves, for our parents, our grandparents, our children. So the real question is going to be, can we stay as real in our person-to-person -person encounters as we've tried to be? when we turn screens into portals. We have to care as much when we're really sitting next to each other, yes. tolerate each other and cherish each other as much when we're actually there as we've been when it's been safe to say I love you without looking someone eye to eye. Right. So Isaiah, you have a role in Jewish communal life to build community across communities, right? You sit at a very high altitude, look nationally, internationally. How do you see this adventure um, that Menachem has been leading us on as a model for building community? Oh, I love that question. You know, when it comes to Jewish engagement in the 21st century and cultivating a sense of belonging, I'm not sure how many people have successfully done that um, through a screen and virtually yeah. the way I think you've been able to capture. And when it comes to creating access points into Jewish life, access points into to Torah study, I was speaking with somebody earlier about barriers that might exist and that prevent us from, from connecting. Something that I think was modeled beautifully, um, and Kim, you shared this before about UJA as a pulpit. Um, you know, this idea that, yes, that, that we could create sacred space that were on holy ground, right? And ultimately, diversified access points into Jewish life is not just about recruitment. It's not just about numbers. It's about retention which we also saw people continuing to come back. It's about cultivating something of, of relevance. These are all ours, by the way, recruitment, retention, relevance. Yeah. And then it's about relationships. And one thing that I love, <laughs> and it's come up as a theme, is that when people would join, you would say good morning to them. 
So it's not just about bringing people in. It's the relationships that allow for, those, for that sense of belonging to, to be cultivated. I come on Monday, I maybe miss Tuesday, but I come back Wednesday and you're like, oh, hi, good to see you. So how's your fit? Someone so-and-so is calling from, from this part of the world. And, and that idea of, of feeling visible, I think, is, is ultimately a part of the ingredients we need in our, our Jewish community. Yes, creating those diversified access points, as we've seen modeled so beautifully through UJA and your leadership, Rabbi. And also, how do we keep things person-centered? And this idea of a person-centered approach is really synonymous with this word equity, social equity, creating the ability that I meet people where they're at. And I just think this was something that was modeled beautifully. As, and, and you know, on, the, on another note, just another piece, when thinking about Jewish communal life in the 21st century, you know, the word Zion or Zion, as much as it means Jerusalem, it also means to be a beacon. It means to be a light. And we know that the work that UJ, you saw on the, on the screen, the four quarters, things that people are thinking about, reimagining Jewish life so that our institutions are truly at Zion, are a beacon for all of us to come to. That, that, that live yeah. widget that shows up, UJ has gone live, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that we should be at Zion, um, I think is powerful. All right. Thank you both. Uh, Look forward to celebrating many, many more days having the wonderful book in this season of darkness. It will be a help for all of us, right? To have a great book when, we, when it's not 9 o'clock in the morning Eastern time uh, to be on Facebook. Thank you to the students who wrote. I wish we had screens. That's all that's missing on this stage because I bet that chat is very lively. Um, <laughs> and, and I hope you'll enjoy looking at all the comments later because I'm sure they're going to be wonderful. But I think it's time for Stephanie now, if I'm not mistaken. Is that, oh, Stephanie. Hi. Hi. This is Stephanie Gary, by the way, everyone, a very dear friend. Yeah, they won't. Yeah. You have to come up here. Wow. Hi. Hi. <laughs> 419. It's a remarkable, a remarkable number. Whether I'm sitting in my home in Stamford, Connecticut, or I'm at my other home, which is on 91st in Amsterdam at Plaza Jewish Community Chapel, when 9 o'clock strikes, I get a pop-up on my phone. And it says, tune in to UJ Federation with Rabbi Menachem Creditor. And in that moment, it centers my day. Some days, I have to admit, you know, I'm a little too busy. I have a meeting or something's going on, and I'm unable to attend. But when I tune in the next day, I always hear, good morning, Stephanie. And I thank you for that. Your messages are filled with courage. They are filled with justice. And we all are in that uncomfortable spot of being virtual, and here we are being present. And I say to you, on behalf of members of your flock <laughs> and all the people who are out there, and we are honored to be members of your flock, we look forward to you guiding us through this next phase, this next journey, in terms of balancing, finding the place we need to be in the day. And we wish you strength, and we thank you so much from the bottom of all of our hearts for your thoughtfulness, for your heart, and your ever-presence in our lives. So thank you. Thank you so much. I don't want to, can I, can I do it? I do a little? OK, just a little. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask. 
I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to do one more thing with me, and no one has to rush away, but I, I would like you all to do me a favor. And wherever is, where's the camera that people are being broadcasted to? It's right here. Can you just turn and welcome everybody who's there? Just with your eyes, with your hands, with your hearts. We've done something real, and we're not done doing it. You're here with us, friends. You are here with us, and we need you. Whether you're in Australia, or Saudi Arabia, or Berkeley, wherever you are, and if you're in Vegas, but you actually came here. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, there is something really precious about just acknowledging each other. And so I'll ask you to, to do one last thing with me, which is to sing another song. Um, and if I could also be so bold, um, to Sarah and to Kyle and to Amanda, you just raise your hand where you are, right? Please know <laughs> they represent 24 rabbinical students who are about to emerge into the world as religious leaders, having gone through an education that I will never understand. The way for us to chart the path forward is to recognize it isn't going to be for all of Stephanie, your, your sweetness about following one person and being a flock that follows one person, that's not good for the world. We have to share. That's, that's wiser. And we do share. Facebook is weird. It makes it look like it's one person's face and other people's comments. But I got to tell you, that would be really boring. I wouldn't keep showing up. <laughs> so let's sing a little bit about the world that could be. If, if you don't know it, there are three words to this song. Wrote it for my children and for you. So the three words, I'll just ask you to say them after me so you can know them before you sing them. And if you already know them, say it anyway so that everyone else feels OK. <laughs> and wherever you are, we hear you. Olam, chesed, yibane. And I want to be very clear about why. When I first wrote the song, the lines in English were, I will build this world from love, and you will build this world from love. And if we build this world from love, then God will build this world from love. But when I recorded it, it became clear to me that it wasn't a given that I will and you will. So I said, I will because I can commit myself, but you must. So I'm asking you not to follow me anywhere, but to make sure that we do this work together. You must. This world is in dire need of everything you can do. So I promise I'm going to be part of it, but I'm asking you to remind yourself of your capacity, your power, and then decide to use it. So let's sing. And then when we're done with the song, I'm probably just going to be a puddle on the floor. Um, so this will, be, this will be the formal close of our evening. Let's sing it together with our hearts. And then no one has to run away, but I am so touched that we got together this way to mark this moment together. I will build this world from love 
And you must build this world from love. And if we build this world from love, then God will build this world from love. Olam Chesed, one more time. Olam Chesed, Hibane. Yadonai, nai, nai, yadonai, Olam Chesed, Hibane. Yadonai, nai, nai, yadonai, nai. Just the ooh. Ooh. Bless you all, everybody. Have a wonderful night.